Thank you for being at the Gate Church today. We're honored to have you. What a wonderful, incredible, beautiful weekend we've had. Is that not amazing? I just want to say thank you to all of our serve teams that have helped this week in particular with our, our pumpkin patch. We had hundreds Friday and Saturday. We had hundreds of families on our campus, and it's amazing to see us able to bless our neighborhood, our city in an incredible way. Uh, somebody in our church met people down way down on the south side, and they said, we don't, we don't do anything until we come all the way to 7700 North Council. Uh, with our kids uh, this time of year. So we're grateful for that. What an incredible team has worked to put everything together. If you have any afternoon time and you're free and you could help, we, need, we actually found out we need more volunteers than we, than we have uh, because sometimes the crowds are so large. If you can uh, help drive a train or help talk to people, we just want people to know that the Gate Church loves our city. We want to be able to tell them we do this because we love you. We love your family. We want God to bless your family. Would you give all of our serve teams a great big hand, those who serve every week here at the gate. Thank you so much for all that you do to serve us. I, uh, this week, I had an opportunity to, um, can you guys put, uh, Cole and Eva celebrated a three-year anniversary of receiving a gift to their life by the name of Elliot uh, this week. Can you all put Elliot's picture up for me? Have you all got it up there? I think that's my picture. <laughs> we look a little bit like him, each other. Uh, anyway, for those that don't know who Elliot is, Elliot is five years old now, right? Five. He's five. Right at five. He's a little blonde headed boy about this big that looks like Cole. It's amazing. It is, it's incredible. So I was going out to get a haircut the other day, and, and Elliot had gotten in from preschool and was sitting there, and I said, Elliot, you want to go with me? He said, where are you, where are you going, Bishop? <laughs> I said, I'm going to get a haircut. He, he said, you don't have no hair. <laughs> I said, but that's one of the things my barber specializes in, and if you come with me, They'll make your hair look like mine. And I could tell his little mind was just turning. And he said, what? I said, they can make your head look like my head. And he goes, he looks at me and he goes, then there'll be two bishops. <laughs> there be two bishops. It's also great to have with us this morning in our, in our audience one of our one pastor friends from California. Jim Snyder, stand up. Let us welcome you. We're glad you're here today. Glad for Pastor Jim being here. God bless you, sir. I can't imagine what's going to happen tomorrow night, but you better get here early. It's going to start at 6.30. We'll open with worship. William McDowell will be here tomorrow night. Uh, William's life has been, I don't know, th even this past week, it, it just happened to be so that he was on Sid Roth's program, The Supernatural. He's been on several television programs this week just talking about the unusual amount of miracles that have been happening in their church. And they're happening during worship while people are worshiping. Cancers are disappearing. The national news even picked up one instance. I'm sure he'll tell the story tomorrow. An incurable disease that only 11 people in America have ever survived. They have no medicine for it. And seven of those people are in his church. Is that incredible? It's just amazing what God is doing as God's touching lives. You're going to want to be here. It's going to be a great night for you to invite your friends. William is a dear friend to us, and we're grateful for him coming. I want to pick up where I left off last week. How many of you have been here the last two weeks in a row where we've been talking about increase and multiplying? Hold your hand up. Wave at me. If you haven't been here, you can go online and watch them and, and catch up to where we are. Uh, I'm not going to do a full review of all that. But I, I want to talk about experiencing the blessed life. How many of you have a desire to live a blessed life? Now, how many of you know a blessed life doesn't have necessary neighborhoods to it or cars that you drive or clothes that you wear? Those are status things. Those are things that people enjoy. That's not necessarily the sign of somebody blessed. Sometimes it's a sign of people with good credit. Jesse DePlanis said to me one day, he said, you don't own it, 
until somebody can't take it from you. Your name may be on it, but if they can take it from you, it's not yours yet. And God wants you to be an owner. That's a prophetic word for somebody in the room today. God wants you to be an owner. Your life changes when you recognize that he put his people in the earth, not just to, we're not just renting this place. We're supposed to have ownership in this place. Here's what the word of God declares. Here's our theme verse. Stand with me as we read it together. Everybody stand with me. Psalms 115 verse number 14 says this. I want you to read it out loud with me. May the Lord cause you to flourish, both you and your children. Say it again. May the Lord cause you to flourish, both you and your children. Father, I pray in Jesus' name the next several minutes will be filled with the spirit of revelation. The presence of God will talk to us, speak to us, and transform us. And the truth of your word will cause us to live transformed lives. In Jesus' name, everybody shout amen. Amen. High five three people and tell them I'm going to experience the blessed life. Come on, just tell them. You can be seated. One of the things we've been talking about is we've been talking about increase. We've been talking about multiplication. We've been talking about the blessed life. And the reason is, is because we position ourselves for God to be able to bless us and to increase us. I talked a couple weeks, weeks ago about the scripture in Malachi that says, can a man rob God? And the truth of the matter is God's not broke. It's not about money. It's not about finances. How do we rob God? We literally put ourselves in a position where God can't do in our lives what he desires to do because our disobedience and our lack of trust moves us out from being positioned for those blessings. So I rob God from being God in my life. When God wants to show up and help me, work with me, multiply what I have, I hold him off because I don't acknowledge him or his ways. I mean, even though he's not only a king, but he has a kingdom. And a king is who he is. The kingdom is the systems of operation by which he functions. So we have to learn God's ways. The Bible says about Moses when he came out of Israel, says Israel knew his acts, but Moses knew his ways. There's a lot of people can point to something and say, that's a miracle. God did that. It's another thing to point at something and say, that is a miracle, and I know how it happened. I know how to multiply that. I know how to do that many times over because I don't just know how to identify an act of God. I know how the ways of God work and the principles of God. Listen to this closely. The principles of God work anywhere all the time for anybody. Let me just say this again in case somebody's watching. This Bible is not an American Bible. This one happens to be in English, but the words that are in it are not just to people that speak English. This Bible works anywhere. I've watched this Bible work in Haiti. I've seen it work in Malawi. I've seen it work in in places in the world where they didn't even have paper money to deal with. And God multiplied the things that people have. Why? Because this is God's word to his people. This is God's manual for how you experience life at its optimum level. You can't disobey this book and experience God's best. That's really good, Bishop. Amen. Thank you for sharing that with us. How many of you know this verse says it's not only for you but for your children? Somebody shout, my children. In other words, God wants me to live and he wants me to leave. A legacy. And my job as a pastor, listen, my job as a pastor is not to preach sermons and build buildings. That's not my job. I, I get the privilege of doing that. We got a lot of people here that preach well. But one of the things that is my primary responsibility is to help you grow. How many of you know Jesus will take you just like you are? Come on, how many of you are glad for that? Jesus will take you just as you are. But he won't leave you like he found you. 
because he wants to help you to grow, to mature, so you can walk into things that God has intended for your life. So it's important we understand that from the beginning of time, God's intention is for his people to flourish and not stress out. How many of you know the word flourish? Somebody shout flourish. The word flourish literally means, in the, in the Hebrew language, it means to thrive or to come to one's prime. Or if you're talking about a flower, it's one that's fully blossomed out. All of the beauty of it is able to be seen. Here's what God says. Your life has incredible potential, and I want to bring you to the mature place in your life where people can see the beauty of everything I put in your life. I want you to flourish in such a way that the world can see who it is and what it is that I've done in your life. How many of you know today that many of you work with people that you're the only Bible they ever read? You realize that? Some of you have family members. You're the only Bible they'll ever read. So they read your life to determine what your God's like. Let me try that again. They read your life. That's why when the Apostle Paul wrote the New Testament, he said this, we are epistles read of all men. In other words, the people that don't know God, don't read the Bible, are constantly reading my life. And when they read my life, they come to know the kind of God I serve. Because they know Tony ain't that smart. You can put your name in the blank right there. It's okay. I won't hurt my feelings. Tony's not that smart. How did he do that? There's no way he should be doing those things. How did that happen? He's got a God who has caused him to flourish, to thrive, to come to his ultimate and optimum level of living. So if that's true, here's my problem. Why then is stress the number one issue in people's life? And watch this. And financial stress is the number one thing that people stress out about the most. More marriages have been put under tension by finances than anything else. Y'all don't have to shout at me because I'm preaching good right now. More fusses, or maybe you call them debates, or maybe you call them really heavy conversations, have been created in homes over finances. How many of you know, somebody said not long ago, said that ladies, they sort of like to, they, they eat things up a little at a time. It's a, you know, nails, a dress, a hairdo. Men destroy finances all at once. It's a boat, a truck. Huh? Because stress is the is we, we, we're giving more pills in America today for people who are under stress. And the biggest cause of stress, according to every survey I researched, the number one stress thing in America is finances. But God intended for me to flourish and to not stress out. So if God intended for me to flourish and not stress out, then how many of you know you and I don't need to be a part of that statistic? Come on, I need a bigger amen than that. We don't need to be a part of that statistic. So here's what happens. God doesn't want you to spend sleepless nights wondering how you're going to get to the end of the month. God doesn't want you having marriage tension. He doesn't want you worrying about mortgage payments and car payments and student loans. And now listen to me. This is not a campaign. At the end of these three weeks, I'm not passing out a card and asking you to make a commitment about giving because the reality is I am on a mission to see every person at the Gate Church live life at a higher level because Jesus really is the Lord of your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's what I believe. This is my basic philosophy. I choose to believe that God's people are not stingy. I just believe they're strapped. I don't believe they're stingy because I don't believe you can be a child of God and not have his nature. Generosity is the nature of my father. The Bible says, for God so loved that he what? He gave. How many of you know you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving? 
And God didn't just say, I, he didn't say, I love you. He said, I so loved. So to measure the measure of my giving, I gave the very best I had. I gave my only begotten son. It's the nature of my father to be a giver. I am his son. I don't believe I'm stingy. There's just times in my life that I've been strapped. Does anybody in the room know what I'm talking about? And it's because I live my life in small, with such small margins, I can't even do the things I know I'm supposed to do in obedience, nor can I do the things I want to do in generosity. We're going to shout before the day's over. Just stay with me. Listen, don't miss this. When the margins go down, the stress goes up. That's worth writing. When your margins go down in any area of your life, how many of you know if you have a 20-minute ride to work and you didn't leave until 22 minutes before you had to be there, you ride looking for every black car you know with a little thing on top of it? Hmm? Come on now. Why? Because when margins go down, stress goes up. You get to work, your blood pressure's up, you're anxious, and people say, What's, what, why are you so uptight? Well, I left late. I've been looking for policemen the whole way here, so I, didn't, I couldn't afford another ticket. Hmm? I mean, you know, financially, when the margins go down, the stress goes up. So for many of us in this room, it's not an income issue. It's a lifestyle issue. I didn't realize that hit the back wall like it did. See, the enemy wants to keep you from God's best. He wants to rob you of your destiny. Do you believe that? For the thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, he wants to slaughter, and he wants to destroy. What's he want to destroy? He wants to destroy your future. He wants to so tie you up in the present that you have no hope of the tomorrow. Because tomorrow you're still paying off yesterday. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have everything in abundance and more than you could ever expect. I want to give you life in its fullness. Life in its fullness till it overflows. I had a guy tell me one day, he said, it doesn't take any more faith to live in the overflow than to live out of the bottom of the barrel. If you're going to live by faith, you might as well live in the overflow. Come on, anybody ready to get in faith with me for the overflow? I'm ready to get in faith for the overflow. Watch this. How many of you know that in the, the, Jesus gave some instructions about things that would come on the earth after his ascension? He was talking about the fact when I send back, the earth is going to go into all kinds of different groanings. Some people talk about this being at the end of time, but the truth of the matter is this started in about 70 A.D., all the things that Jesus talked about in, in Luke chapter 21 started happening not long after he went back to heaven because the earth is groaning. The earth's not groaning for the rapture. The earth is groaning for the church to grow up and be mature. That level of amens is hurting my feeling. No, listen, I'm just kidding. Listen. Listen. The earth is groaning for people to rise up to be the mature sons of God so they actually know how to possess the earth the way Christ wants them to. But here's what Jesus said. He said, when the earth begins to groan, you need to learn to be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the worries of life. And they will not come on you suddenly, watch this, like a trap. Here's what Jesus said. He said, you're going to have to guard your heart because there's several things coming after it. He said, the first one is you're going to experience dissipation. Dissipation is the loss of things due to misuse. It's the evaporation of things that you should be having. Anybody ever felt like you had stuff that just evaporated? Where'd that go? It just dissipated. I had it last month. I don't have it this month. Where'd it go? I don't know. It just, it just disappeared in thin air. Jesus said, the things that are going to come against you is there's going to be things you ought to be able to possess, but the enemy is going to attack you so that they dissipate. They literally are lost because of misuse. 
He said, you're going to have to be on guard for drunkenness. Now, how many of you know that has multiple applications? I want to say something to you. It is never the will of God for you to be drunk on alcohol. Just in case you're wondering how I felt about that. I just want to go and get that out. But how many of you know there's a lot of people that would never touch a bottle of beer and never touch a glass of wine or never take a hard drink, but they are drunk on ambition. They are drunk on chasing success. They are drunk on what other people think about them. If they're not keeping up with the Joneses, that's what I try to do in my life. I try to keep up with the Joneses. <laughs> People spend their whole life, they're drunk on wanting to be a part of somebody's club. I never cease to be amazed the people that will sell out values in order to be accepted in a certain group. Who'll spend money they don't have to be recognized by people who really don't care. We keep trying to impress folks that don't even care. He said, so here's what's going to happen. You're going to have to guard your heart because here's where it's going to set in. It's going to set in your heart. You're going to set in your heart to dissipate things. It's going to set in your heart to cause you to be drunk on all kinds of things. And he said, here's the last one. He said, make sure you guard your heart against the worries of life. In other words, don't let stress overtake you. Paying bills, getting kids through college. How am I going to get this family where it needs to go? He said, here's what I want you to know. If you let that happen, watch this, hold on. He said, if you let that happen, it's going to come on your life and it's going to be like a trap. You don't have to answer me, but I wonder how many people in this room today would say something like this, Bishop, how did I get here? I don't even know how I got in this position. And Jesus said that the way it comes is it comes on you suddenly, but it really evaporates slowly. You get intoxicated with the wrong things. You start worrying about all kinds of stuff. And next thing you know, you're trapped. Jesus doesn't want you to be in a trap. The Bible has so much to say about your, your resources, your finances, your life as a family. Do you realize, hold on, do you realize that there are over 2,500 verses in the Bible about money and resources? And there's only one verse in the Bible that says you need to be born again. We build whole denominations off of one verse and leave churches over people who preach about the other 2,500. I ain't going to that church no more. They're down there talking about my money. Well, let me just put you at rest. We don't, we're, going to, we're going to be here next week whether you give or not. We're going to be here next week whether you give or not. I don't know if you will be, but we will be. Hmm? I feel good today. Hallelujah. So what happens is there's 16 parables that Jesus gave in the New Testament that are related totally to resources and how you handle them. Because Jesus said this, if you want to know where a man's heart is, see what he does with his resources. I had a guy one time that was, he was going to, am I doing okay? Can I keep going? I had a guy one time, he came up to me and he said, uh, he said, I think I'm about to leave the church. I don't know. He said, I don't know. I just got bored and I, whatever. And I said, that's fine. I understand that people leave churches all the time. I said, but if you, if he said, I love you. I said, well, you, can I help you find a way to really love the church? He said, if you can help me love it, I'd love to. I said, here's what you do. Get your checkbook out and write a check for $25,000 and make it out to the church. And tomorrow you'll love the church. You want to know why when you come out at the mall and an alarm is going off three rows over from where your car is and you don't even pay no attention to it, you get in your car and leave? Because you didn't pay for that one over there. But you get in that one that's yours, the alarm's going off, you pick your pace up and find out who broke in your car. Why? Because you paid for that. Jesus said where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart's going to be. That's why you're not letting folks come put a tent up in your front yard. 
What would you tell them if you walked out? I, I paid for this yard. Hold on. Whoa, wait a minute, bud. You in the neighbor's yard? That's his problem. I'm just reading the B-I-B-L-E, folks. Come on now. Here's what Jesus, here's what the Bible, here's what Paul said. Paul said, when I was a child, I, here, here's, the, here's the characteristic of a child. He said, I spoke like a child, I understood like a child, and I thought like a child. How many of you know there are some people that are 45 and still treating resources as if they're 12? See, when my kids were 12, I'd say, I don't have any money right now. And they'd say, well, you got a checkbook. As long as you got a checkbook, you got to have money. How many of you know that's a child's mindset? Nowadays, it's not a checkbook, it's a debit card. Or worse yet, it's a credit card. Got a credit card, you got money. Well, if I can't pay the bill at the end of the month, I don't have money. So the childishness in our life is we speak like children, we understand like children, and we think like children. But Paul said, when I became a man, I put away childish things. Can we keep going? Can I keep going today? Can we, can we keep growing so we can experience the blessed life that God wants for us? See, what is it that causes us to not experience the blessed life? Write them down quickly. I'm gonna, I want to show them to you real quickly. Here's number one. We confuse stewardship with ownership. In other words, there's a biblical truth about my possessions. You know what? I've been privileged in my life to help families through difficult times in their life, and particularly uh, the death of a loved one. I've done hundreds of funerals. I've done all kinds. I've done kinds where people celebrated because they knew their loved one was in heaven. I've done funerals where everybody knew the person that had died was not ready to meet God. It was great weeping. But there's one thing that has never happened at any funeral I've ever conducted, or hundreds of funerals. I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul. You can check today. Go, go by every funeral home in town, and I can guarantee you you don't find any hearses with a ball on the back. Because the truth is, nobody takes anything with them. That's right. Amen. So the question in my life is, am I fooling myself into believing I'm an owner when in reality, I'm a steward? Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. What's your address? Just shout out what street. Don't give me the numbers because I don't want anybody to come to your house. Just shout out the street you live on. Just yeah, yeah, He owns that. He owns that street. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and those who live in it. Look what Jesus said. Look what the Bible said. He said, I have no need of a bull from your stall or goats from your pens. For every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains, and insects in the fields are mine. And if, it, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. For the world is mine, and all that's in it. God said, if I was in a tight place, I wouldn't ask you for anything, because you don't have anything to give me, because everything you got, I already own. <laughs> here's, what, here's what the New Testament says, 1 Corinthians 10, 26. For the earth is the Lord's and everything. Somebody shout everything. everything. Everything that's in it. Ladies, look at your finger. If you've got a diamond on it, it came from God's coal. If you've got a pearl around your neck, it came from God's oyster. If you rode in an automobile here today, it came from God's iron ore. Because everything in the earth belongs to God. See, all this thing about ownership started in the garden. It started in the Garden of Eden. God gave Adam one instruction. He said, Adam, I'm going to put you in this garden, and I want you, well, two instructions. I want you to tend it, and I want you to guard it. Excuse me. 
The word tend literally means I want you to steward it. I want you to manage it. I want you to take care of it and guard it so that nothing comes to destroy it. When the enemy showed up, when Lucifer showed up to Eve, what did he tell her? Eat. If you eat, watch this. The, the Bible says it this way. If you eat, you'll become like God. What was God? God was the owner of everything. He was literally saying to her, if you eat, you can be an owner. You can make your own decisions, go your own way, create your own world, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. If you eat of what belongs to God, then you can become an owner like he is because God's an owner. Hmm. How many of you know that was really not a good decision? Can I, can, I, can I be really, I want everybody, just please give me your attention for just a minute. This is rarely talked about, and I'm going to talk about it after the first year a little bit more. Do you know everybody in the room, there's two questions that's going to be asked in eternity of every person in the room. Two questions. And God's so kind, he gives you the test beforehand. He lets you know what the two questions are going to be. And he gives you the, so you can prepare the answer. First question is going to be asked of every person in this room is he's going to ask you, what did you do with my son Jesus? What did you do with Jesus? If you don't get that answer right, don't worry about the second one. It's like one of them forms. If you say no here, then don't worry about doing the rest of it. Because the next question is only for those who decided to make Jesus the Lord of their life. And the second question that every person will answer in eternity is this. Not only what did you do with my son Jesus, the next question is, and what did you do with your life while you were on earth? I gave you a job. I gave you money. I gave you influence. I gave you a home. I gave you a car. I gave you blessing. I gave you favor. What did you do with it? while you were on earth. And the answer to that question will determine how heaven will be for you. We're pretty quiet in here today. What did you do with what I gave you? Now here's what I want you to understand. We don't serve money. We serve God. That's worth repeating. We don't serve money. We serve God. Watch this. While we don't serve money, we serve God. The reason people serve money is because it makes them feel secure. It makes them feel significant. Can I say this? Money is, is amoral. Money has no morality. The same $100 bill you gave today in church could have been used three days ago to buy a drug deal. Because money has no morality. You give it its morality. In other words, you give it meaning. Hmm? And watch this. And money is only an indicator. It's a revealer. If you see people that become more arrogant the more money they get, money didn't make them arrogant arrogant. Arrogance was already there. They just didn't have any reason to display it. If money made you start feeling superior after you got it, you felt superior beforehand. Money just began to reveal what you really were. That's why I tell folks, I said, we don't really know how many people are faithful to church until they have something. Some people come every weekend because they ain't got no options. If you could be at the lake 50 weeks out of the year, you'd be there if you had the money. That was, that's what's in your heart, but you ain't got no options, so you come to church. This is the best form of entertainment you got on Sunday morning. I am really preaching good right now, praise the Lord. But when we find out where somebody's heart is, is when they got enough resources to have options and they choose 
to give God the first place in their life and they choose to honor the house of the Lord, then we say their heart is after God. Hallelujah. Because money serves us, we don't serve money. And money serves us as we serve God. Here's point number two. Another reason we don't enjoy the blessed life is because we are consumed with having more. Having more. In parentheses, just put this statement. I need to learn how to act my wage. Hmm? I need to learn how to act my wage. We live in a consumer-driven society. Everything about our world is built on consumerism. We just saw it displayed this week. We're willing to lay values down so that American companies or entertainment things like basketball, we'd sacrifice values in order to make more money. We watch government officials for the sake of what will make us more profit choose things that are not necessarily right for us. Why? Because we are consumed with having more. We believe somehow, contrary to what the Bible taught, Jesus said this, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. You can own it all and still be an empty bag. Come on, somebody help me. Amen? So here's what happens. The Ecclesiastes says this. Look at this. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 says, Better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Yes, sir. I'd rather have one handful with peace yes, than two handfuls and constantly having to pedal my bicycle faster to keep up with what it is I'm trying to do. Jesus told a parable about this. You've probably never seen this parable this way, but I want to use it. Jesus said there was a man who had two sons and the younger one said to his father, Father, give me, give me, give me, my name's Jimmy. Hmm? <laughs> give me my share of the estate. So he, decide, decide, he divided his property between them. Watch this. Here's the key. He wanted something I don't think that's working. He wanted something ahead of time. Give me the share of the estate. It was already mine. I just want it ahead of time. I want everybody in the room that's 30 and under, please listen to me. Here's a key phrase. This is, this is the characteristic of all of us when we're young. If I got any witnesses in the room, we live in a generation where people want at 32 what it took Kathy and I 35 years of marriage to obtain. I want to live in the same neighborhood you live in in three years that it took you 30 years to get there. Why? Why? Because a missing element in our culture is this right here. We are missing delayed gratification. It shows up in every part of our culture. It shows up with people in their morality, sexual activity. We don't wait to marriage anymore because we can't delay our gratification. We don't wait till we finish certain things to start other things because we want it now. We're consumed with having more and more and more. What we don't realize is that by not having delayed gratification, we continually set ourselves up to be trapped. Do you realize all the college students in here can probably help me? All the college students in here can, can probably verify this. Most major universities, when you go for registration, and orientation. Do you know what's set up in the college hallways as well as science and all the other clubs you can join and fraternities? Do you know what's set up? Credit card companies. 
Am I, am I help, some of the college students help me. Is that right? Credit card companies. So that when you get away from your parents, get on your own, you're told the first thing you need to really have is a credit card. So if we can get you in these next four years tied up with student loans and credit card debt and believing you got to have a new automobile, by the time you graduate, we will have destroyed your real opportunity for destiny. Because you're going to spend the next 25 years of your life paying off this last five years of your life that you enjoyed. Preach, Bishop. <laughs> Look at this. The rich rule over the poor. And the borrower is servant to the lender. That's why the gate church needs to get out of debt. I'm going to say it one more time. That's why the gate church needs to be totally debt free. Do you know how fast we could run on the things God's telling us if we didn't have to be servant to the one who loaned us the money to pay all this off? I'm grateful for their help, but how many of you are ready to free them up so they can go on and give it to somebody else? Is anybody in the room helping me? Today's our third Sunday offering. We, by the way, we get to take our house for the, uh, heart for the house offering today at the end of the service. So we're doing that because we can accelerate this and get all this stuff done and out of the way and moving towards what God's called us to do. Do you know in the Old Testament, God forbid his people in the community of faith, he forbid his people for charging their brothers interest. It's called usury. Usury. And the reason they couldn't charge them interest, hold on to your seat, because I, I realize somebody may not be running and waving a hanky right now, but I'm helping somebody. When you're taking money on a card and paying 15 and 18% interest on it, let me tell you what's happened. The word interest or usury in the Bible, it's in the Bible multiple times. The root word comes from a word that means snake bite. That's the root of it. So when you pay interest, you have been snake bit. It's like a rattlesnake walked up and just bit you. You say, well, Bishop, how in the world do you do things? I understand that everybody in the room, listen, Kathy and I made huge mistakes in the early days of our life. And God had to, God had to, Teach, you know, Tony sometimes, I don't, I don't, you guys are wonderful. Tony sometimes don't learn until he feels. My daddy used to tell me that. I guess that's why I feel like that. He said, son, if you can't learn, you have to feel. My feeler is a quick learner. We were pastoring our first church, our first church. My, my dad was a successful businessman and in, all, in ministry, but he was also had a successful business. He and mother lived in a wonderful home. I'm thinking, hey, I'm my daddy's son. I ought to be able to do that. I didn't understand at that point in time it took him 30 years to get there. So I, we were driving this little Le Mans Pontiac. I don't even know if they make Le Mans anymore. I don't think they do. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's just like, like a little Pontiac. I don't even think Pontiac exists anymore. It was a little GM car. Well, I'm really dating myself. I've outlived the automobiles. It did have a windshield and a roof. I mean, it was not like total model two. We had this little Le Mans, and I said, you know what? I'm, I believe God. We are, we're now pastor of the church. I'm, a, I'm now a senior pastor. We can, we can really do better. Status ought to improve. That doesn't look very good if I pull up like that. So a guy said to me, he said, I got a Cadillac Fleetwood that is only a year old, year and a half old. He said, I've had to trade it in. The guy that owned the dealership come to me and he said, preacher, do you want this car? 
He said, I'll sell it to you so right you can't say no. It was an incredible deal. So I bought it. A black Fleetwood long. I was either a preacher or a pimp because they're the only two people that rode in town with it. <laughs> That's the only two folks that came to town with that. I mean, I was fly. You know what I'm talking about? It had red interior leather. It was bad to the bone. And I'd put windows down just so people could see who was in it. That's back in the day we believed that if you ran the air conditioning, it took more gas. Yep. I'm, I'm riding this. We pull up in front of our house. And one day, the alternator went out in it. So I thought, it's just an alternator. I got some buddies. We can change an alternator. Nope. Not on a Fleetwood Cadillac, you couldn't. Nope. I had to take it to the shop. Took it to the shop. Now, hold on. I was making $235 a week. You say, how are you doing it? Well, I'm living in a parsonage, so I don't have to pay for my house. If I got $235 a week, I'm rich. I took that sucker to the shop. And the mechanic walked out and said to me, he said, uh, he said, yeah, it's alternator. Go have to replace the alternator. I said, okay, let's slap, let's slap one. How much, how much is it? I've been used to like Ford Falcons, Pontiacs, you know, $165. He said, it'll be $895. I said, for the alternator? I'm not asking to put a new engine in it. I just want an alternator. He said, no, it's $895. And he said, and if it takes me longer than I think, it's going to be another $200 for more labor because I've got to take the whole engine apart to put it in there. And I'm going, and I came home and told Kathy, I said, we have a blessing we cannot afford. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should reverse that. <laughs> she said to me. <laughs> she said to me. <laughs> Oh, Jesus, don't hit me right here. <laughs> she said to me, your little Cadillac has got to go because that's a blessing we can't afford. Because we're taking baby's food to try to keep your So I had to learn how to embrace the value of self-control. Do you realize self-control is a fruit of the Spirit? It's one of the realities that the Holy Spirit actually has control of your life. Is the fact that you know how to say no to certain things. I want to say something to you. Listen. A person with self-control, without self-control, is like a city with broken down walls. In other words, when you can't say no to certain things or yes to things that are right, you leave yourself in vulnerable places where somebody can overtake you like never before. It's not that there's a big devil. There's cracks in the wall. In other words, do you really have to have three Starbucks a day? Do I really have to buy a new car that depreciates 20% the day I pull it off the lot? 
Listen, if you're debt free, go buy it. Or if you've got the resources to do it, I'm not, I'm not being critical and I'm not putting guilt on anybody. I'm trying to help people who are reaching for things that they're not able at this time in their life to be able to obtain. And they don't need to feel any guilt and shame because they can't. You don't have to have a matching belt for every outfit. Ladies, I'm done. Listen, here's what I got to close with. You got you got to see this. You got to see this. Don't miss what I'm about to say. And we'll read this scripture. Here's why. Don't miss this. If you miss this, we've missed everything. God puts the disbursement of resources under your control. Everything that comes into your life, he could have blessed you till you're living in the overflow. But if you don't disperse it properly, it's not that God didn't bless. It's not, it's not a resource issue. It's a lifestyle issue and a spiritual issue. Here's why. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a what? A cheerful giver. And here's the key. And God is able. You have to believe that. You have to believe that if I operate by God's ways, he's able to bless me abundantly so that in all things, at all times, Having all that I will need, you will abound unto every good work. Hallelujah. God is able. Now watch this. What you have decided in your heart. That's what he said. You give as you have decided in your heart. We were talking about tithing. I want God to be first in my life. It's the law of representation. If he's not that, I'm not going to try to do something that's not in my heart. But if that's in my heart, I'm going to honor him. And then he's going to be able to bless my 90% more than my 100% altogether. Because I believe only he is able to do that. I was talking to my mother. She's here today. I was talking to my mother the other week. And she's, she lives on a very fixed income of Social Security. And she said every month when I get my check, Whatever my check is on Social Security. She lives alone, lives in her own home, maintains her own house, has her own car. She says to me, she said, and she don't like for me to bless her. I try to. She don't like it, but I do every now and then anyway. But she says, she said to me, when I get my check, first thing I do is write my tithe check because I want God's blessing on everything else I have left in my house. Why? Because you give as is in your heart to give. And you believe he's able. Somebody shout, he's able. That means your seed, he's able to multiply. But here's the key. You guys just come play, play, play for me. Listen. He said, you have to discern. Because everything that comes into your life is one of two things. He said, it's bread for eating and seed for sowing. Let me tell you when you determine that. You don't determine that when you get to church on Sunday morning. You don't get here and look at your wallet and go, well, what what have I got that's seed and what have I got that's bread? You determine that when it comes into your hand. Because listen, your seed is about your future. Please don't, don't miss this because I'm finished this series this week. Your seed has everything to do with your spiritual future, has to do with your financial future. It has to do with your retirement. Do you know some things that come into your hands are not for today, they'll be put put away for tomorrow. That seed to be sown at a different time. It could be your kid's college education. It could be a number of things. But you don't determine it when you get leftovers, you determine it when it comes into your hands. What is seed for my sowing? 
And what's bread for my eating? Bread for my eating is everything that meets my needs in the present. Everything I need to get through this week. God says, trust me that I'm able to cause you to have bread to eat so that you'll have a sufficiency for all good work. That means everything will be met. Hallelujah. I want to pray over you today, boys. Here's what he said. He said, when you do that, it results in thanksgiving to God. You stand up at the end of your life and go, my, what an amazing life. I experienced the blessed life. I don't even know how I did it. I do my taxes every year and look at the money we gave away and I go, I don't know how we did that. But you know what, Kathy and I started doing years ago? We started praying not how much money to make. We started praying how much money to give away. How much can I give away this year? Because I discern everything that comes into my hands. I discern whether he's going to be the Lord of my life and I'm going to give him the law of representation and make him first. And I'm going to honor him with my tithe. Everything else that comes is seed. Because he didn't just say tithe, he said offerings. Do you realize nowhere in the Bible was the tithe ever used to pay for buildings or or facilities? Every building that God ever built in the Bible was all paid for by offerings. Because tithe was meant to carry on the the affairs of the, the storehouse, what was needed in the storehouse for ministry. So there's tithes, there's offerings, there's alms. Any any old timers ever remember when they used to teach you you don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing? That's not a that's not about your tithing or your seed giving and offerings. That's about your alms. In other words, he said if you if you if you go pay somebody's rent, don't go tell 14 people you helped them. Because when you did that, all you're doing is tying their life up with your generosity. You're trying to make control factors be over their life because you helped them at some point in time. If God told you to help them, then give it and forget it. You say, well, they wasted it. It didn't matter what they did with it. God told you to give it. You gave it. They didn't handle it properly. He probably won't tell you to give it next time. But when you give it, you don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. I bless them. They're blessed. Praise the Lord. All of that results in thanksgiving to God.